My name is Mike Aben and welcome to my KSP campaign. Last episode concluded with me rendezvousing with an asteroid and that actually unlocked a number of new milestones. So why don't we take a look at these? Okay, so what do we got here? We have performed a rendezvous man maneuver around the sun. Yeah, we have. We have started constructing the first space station around the sun. Well, I'm not so sure about that. And we have performed a docking maneuver on the sun. Well, that's a good trick. I think the proofreaders need to get in here. But in the meantime, we have a new spacecraft on the pad ready to fly. This is the Sentinel spacecraft, uh, an unmanned probe on its way to a solar orbit uh, with an altitude of, I don't know, a little bit less than, let's see, let's take a look at the contract here, a little bit less than 10.5 million kilometers. That's an orbit actually that makes it, that's a little bit bigger than EVE's orbit. Um, and aboard this particular spacecraft is the Sentinel Infrared Telescope and the job for it is going to be to sit there and scan the skies in near Kerbin looking for near Kerbin asteroids and the contract is complete when this thing is detected six of them. I'm not quite 100% sure exactly how that is supposed to work but it's supposed to be happening passively in the background and I'm putting this on one of my more traditional lifters and not taking it up with the space shuttle because the infrared telescope is actually relatively big for a science part and uh, it will not fit into the cargo bay of my space shuttle. Um, and while this thing is on its ascent, I'll also talk about what else you'll be seeing in this particular episode. Uh, the Corian, the Corian is finally just about ready to leave the Kerbin sphere of influence and uh, we will have our first purples to actually orbit the sun and you'll be seeing that uh, well, once this particular mission is done. But why don't we talk a little bit more about the Sentinel here. This is actually modeled after a uh, real proposed mission. This is a mission that actually, as of this recording, is currently being built and set to be launched sometime in 2016. And the mission is, well, pretty much what this thing is, to put it in an orbit a little bit uh, around the same size as Venus's orbit and to scan looking for near-Earth asteroids. So this is completely modeled after a real-world mission. Whoa, that was a little jarring. Okay, well, anyway, let's deploy this radiator, which may appear a little bit large for a probe of this size, which is a bit of a hint as to what else is special about it. We'll get out this solar panel as well. Yeah, other than going around the sun and having this nifty new science part, this thing is also sporting a new nuclear engine. This is my first nuclear-powered uh, vessel. Specifically, it has the... Candle traveling wave nuclear reactor rocket motor, uh, which comes from Kerbal or Kerbal Interstellar Extended. Uh, this is like a baby cousin of the stock LVN Nerve engine. Um, what it has is it has a nuclear reactor built into it, and uh, it takes propellant, heats up that propellant, expels that propellant out the back for thrust, producing a whopping three kilonewtons of thrust but although the thrust is not huge it's built of its uh efficiency its isp is pretty impressive and the flame effects are pretty pretty nice there as well i think what also i like about this particular engine as opposed to the um the stock lvn engine uh which obviously is much bigger than this and wouldn't have been appropriate for this particular vessel is that this one can run on a variety of different propellants uh, in this tank here all I have is liquid fuel you see that no oxidizer it's not burning the fuel so it doesn't need oxidizer it's simply using it as a propellant it's heating it up and propelling it out the back the fuel is uranium powering the nuclear reactor the other option that this engine has as far as fuel goes is liquid hydrogen um, you can use that as propellant, which gives you less thrust, but higher ISP, I believe, is the way it works. Um, and as you upgrade um, and work your way further down the tech tree, on the nuclear tech tree, uh, you will unlock other propellants that you can use. I went with the liquid fuel because the hydrogen um, has a boil-off problem unless you provide a crap load of electricity to keep it cool. Um, there is a, a thermal nuclear 
or a thermal electric generator, I'm sorry, that I could attach to this particular engine um, that I could use to generate the electricity. The solar wouldn't have been nearly enough to generate electricity. So that I could have done, but I thought, you know what, I'll save weight, go simple, and went with just liquid fuel as a propellant. Anyway, as far as setting up uh, the burn, the transfer burn, uh, this is pretty trivial compared to the other interplanetary burns I've had to do. Uh, there's nothing to rendezvous with, so I just have to get my periapsis down to what it needs to be and uh, just time warp over to the maneuver and uh, perform the burn. But rather than talking about this particular maneuver, I actually want to talk about something that I think is kind of an interesting way uh, in the way Interstellar deals with heat as compared to the way uh, the stock KSB deals with heat. Oh, and by the way, you might be noticing that I'm using the remote tech flight computer to execute this particular node. Uh, you saw me using this a lot last episode for my asteroid rendezvous, and I kind of fell back in love with it again. And I think, you know, now that I'm into the sort of mid-range pro bodies, I, I think I can justify, from a tech standpoint, the use of this flight computer. So I'm going to be using it more often uh, in the rest of this particular campaign. But what I want to talk about is heat. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to right-click on the radiator, and what I want you to pay attention to is the waste heat gauge. This gauge comes from the interstellar mod, and what I want you to take note of is that it is climbing. It is raising up right now with the engine off. Now this makes perfect sense, because it's not like the nuclear reactor turns on and off. It's, it's going all the time, always generating heat, and right now that heat's got nowhere to go. So it's going to build up within the craft, and if this thing gets up to the top, uh, bad things start to happen. Things don't explode, that's not what Interstellar does, but the reactor would shut down and this probe would be dead. Now what I want you to do is pay attention to what happens when the engine comes on. Here we go, we've now started our burn, and notice the waste heat is now decreasing. Again, from a physics standpoint, this makes perfect sense. We are expelling that heat out the back end, uh, and that is cooling down the craft. In fact, this is very much the same as your the way your refrigerator works. Uh, if your refrigerator was nuclear powered, but <laughs> shooting plasma at the back. But uh, yes, this is cooling the rocket. But take a look up here at Kerbal Engineer and what the temperature data is doing here. Now this is coming from stock, and notice that the critical temperature of the radiator, the radiator is the hottest part, is going up. Why? Well, because that's the way uh, stock deals with heat. The engine's on, so we're generating heat, just like any other engine. And so it's heating up the craft, so it's kind of funny. The, the engine is actually simultaneously cooling and heating this craft. Uh, it's like there's two different types of heat being generated at the same time. It's too bad that the two things don't cancel each other out and this thing would just uh, run at the same temperature always. Why don't we cut to the later part of the burn? And, and by the way, you may have been wondering with that waste heat gauge, you probably noticed that it was probably in around a quarter, I think about a quarter uh, to the top, a quarter full. And that was just with this thing, it hasn't even done a complete orbit around Kerbin yet, and it's already like, you know, a quarter of the way to overheating. Um, and so you might go, well, how the hell is this thing going to deal with 100 days in space as it makes its way to this orbit it needs to do around the sun? Uh, the thing is, is that uh, as the temperature increases, so does the radiator's ability to radiate away that heat. Interstellar models that. It doesn't radiate at a constant rate. It, the hotter it gets, the more heat it's able to radiate. And it, according to the thermal helper, there's a VAB thermal helper that comes with Kerbal Interstellar for helping you decide how big your radiator needs to be. This radiator is plenty, so I'm gonna trust it. If this thing ends up shutting down on me, I'm gonna fully blame Interstellar on that one, but uh, it should be good. Anyway, we are just finishing off our burn here, and then it's going to be 178 days for us to get down to periapsis where we will perform our circularization to insert ourselves into the orbit that this thing needs to be in. Uh, so we will say goodbye to this craft and move on to the Korion. Now on its 23rd day since leaving Kerbin Station, the Korion and her crew are just about set to leave Kerbin's sphere of influence. And if you take a look to the south, 
of the Karayan, you will just see Kerbin there, way, way off in the distance. So there we go, we're time warping, and oh, uh, okay, we got our alarm here, approaching Kerbin's sphere of influence change. Let's take a look at where we are here. Okay, so we've got about 13 minutes to go. Let me time warp that away. Most certainly a momentous day in Kerbal kind as Jeb Glafia and Chrissy Kerman move way beyond the distance that any Kerbal has gone before from home. Oh, whoa, oh, whoa, oh, had a change there. Science alert still. Okay, I'm not. I'm still must be in Kerbin's sphere of influence. But let's let's do an antenna change now. Uh, this little dish antenna now can no longer reach all the way to Kerbin, and I definitely want to uh, transmit some data back. So we're going to activate the bigger Communitron 8888, and we'll pick our target. And I've already set uh, interplanetary relay three pointing in this direction, so that should give us a communication link. Okay, this has got me a little bit confused. My altitude is 83 and a half thousand kilometers. So uh, yeah, I'm definitely still in Kerbin's sphere of influence. Shoot, that's over a day away for the sphere of influence change and way below the equatorial plane of Kerbin. I don't like this. I don't know, should I thrust? I don't think, no, I don't, I, no, let, let's, no, let's let's time warp and uh, just sort of see what I get. It gets me. K KSP just might be confused as to exactly where we are. We are not exiting Kerbin sphere of influence. Whoa, whoa, whoa! We are definitely out now. Look at the science alert mod. It is definitely uh, telling us that we are here. So we'll do a whole bunch of science here. Do a crew report. Keep an eye on electricity, but I want to transmit that one. Make sure, oh, oh no, electricity is hardly going down at all. Good. See what happens when you have enough batteries? This is great. Oh wait, I don't want to do an EVA report yet. I want to, want to get the rest of this stuff. So a materials bay, yes, and we'll transmit that. For sure we'll transmit. We got ourselves a scientist. We can reset all this stuff. Mater uh, mystery goo. Set that on its way. And a temperature scan. Okay, there's nothing to transmit there. We'll just keep it. I've had interplanetary probes, so they have collected some science from high above the sun, but uh, this is my first time having Kerbals out there, first time having a materials bay, uh, first time having a mystery goo. So th th there's much more science there. But let's do an EVA report. We'll transmit that just yet. And then we'll get Chrissy to go about and collect the science. But I mean, first, she has to revel a little bit and take advantage of where she is at. Where is Kerbin? Kerbin, Kerbin, Kerbin. Oh, 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 there it is. Chrissy, go take a look. What a beautiful view. Is Chrissy appreciating her situation? She certainly is. Can't see Kerbin reflected in her visor, but uh, still a nice view nonetheless. Anyway, Chrissy certainly does have a job to do out here. She's got to go up, collect all that science, reset, and then of course we'll collect some more and we'll try and tr we'll transmit everything we can, and then scrounge out all the science that we can out of this uh, out of this area. And then we'll think about hitting ourselves back. Yeah, I think what happened back there where uh, I was sort of bouncing in and out of Kerbin's sphere of influence was just because we were going so freaking slow. If you go back and take a look, you will see that our orbital velocity was only around 19 meters per second. So we were just barely moving by, uh, certainly by orbital standards. And uh, KSP was, we were, must have been just sort of in a, a bit of a fuzzy zone between, it couldn't quite make up its mind whether we were in Kerbin sphere of influence or out of Kerbin sphere of influence, but we are definitely out now and definitely collecting high above the sun's science. Anyway, once this was all finished and accomplished, of course, it was time to start to plot our return back. Now, one thing that would be really awesome if I could 
get the Karayan to rendezvous with Arm B. Uh, that's the asteroid hunter that rendezvoused with an asteroid last episode and is suffering from severe uh, electricity limitations. And I can't seem to find it with the search here. Um, and I can't find the asteroid, so, so I'll just give up on this for now. But uh, hopefully, you know, I'm trying to see if I could get a Kerbal to perhaps fix that battery. That would be really cool. But why don't we add ourselves a maneuver node here, and then we'll use a uh, precise node to bring that node nice and close. So we'll just reduce the time here a little bit. Let's see, 17 minutes. We'll keep bringing it down. We're less than 10 minutes now. Away. Three minutes. Okay, that ought to do it. Now, oh, wait, hang on a second. I was trying to select the asteroid as my target for rendezvous. Uh, well, I think maybe, what if I just selected the probe as a target? So, probes are, oh, there's RMB down there. RMB. Okay, now I got RMB selected as a target. I'll worry about that a little bit. Let's let's think about getting these guys home first. So, it looks here, yes, most certainly, we are ahead of Kerbin in our orbit. So that means we need to slow ourselves down and let Kerbin catch up. So we have to go retrograde. And oh, I already see um, a, a change in sphere of influence marker coming up ahead of me. Now, it turned out making a rendezvous with RMB was, was not going to be in the cards. Uh, the timing of it is all wrong. RMB will be going past Kerbin way, way before the Karayan can get back there. So, uh, it, it, it's not going to happen on this pass. And either RMB is going to survive its pass through Kerbin's atmosphere or it's not. But uh, the Karayan is not in a position to help. So, let's just get back to getting the Karayan back home. So, I'm giving myself... A little bit more retrograde here and I can't see my trajectory in Kerbin sphere of influence so let's focus our view on Kerbin there we go and now I can see my trajectory and oh there's my periapsis with 77 kilometers I want to get my periapsis down in around 50 kilometers so uh, that should be a, a nice comfortable arrow breaking uh, altitude I also want to play with my inclination I do want to rendezvous with the station which is uh, at an, in, in an orbit at an inclination of zero. So I want my inclination uh, of my trajectory to be as very close to zero as I can make it. You might recall that uh, when I set up my exit from Kerbin's sphere of influence, I actually went through some effort to have the Karayan exiting the sphere of influence very close to Kerbin's equatorial plane. So this, this is my moment to see whether this pays off. And uh, so I ended up playing around for a little bit, didn't take too long. I ended up with just a 61 meter per second burn. Uh, that was because the Karayan is just going so freaking slow <laughs> compared to Kerbin. So it came out to be really cheap. Though to be honest, uh, it's taken 23 days to get out here. I think if I were to do this again, I would uh, give, give my ship a little bit more oomph. <laughs> so we can get there and back a little bit quicker. Anyway, we got our burn set up, so uh, let's do it. There we go. Of course, Jeb has no trouble performing this little bitty of a burn. And then after that, it was just a, a few minutes of time warping to re-enter into Kerbin's sphere of influence. And so what you see me doing here is just uh, using a little bit of RCS and the trajectories mod to uh, to fine tune my arrow breaking maneuver just a little bit. I don't want to come in too hot here. Hell, these guys have been out for 23 days and I've still got 17 days until they're going to be doing the arrow breaking. So that's 30 days right there. There's no read to rush it. An extra couple of days is not going to make a difference. But uh, what I do want to point or draw some attention to is my 0.3 degree inclination of this particular trajectory. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. This is going to make this rendezvous relatively cheap. I mean, I still got 825 meters per second left in this particular vehicle, uh, so uh, this shouldn't be a problem at all. But of course, all of that's going to have to be for a future episode. So why don't we make a bit of a transition from uh, things going very, very right to, uh, well, some things going very, very wrong.
Do you like explosions? Of course you like explosions. Everybody likes explosions. Who doesn't like explosions? So uh, I'm here in simulation mode, uh, and uh, I, I, I don't know, this craft turned into be a bit of a headache when it came to struts. Uh, what's going on here is uh, the struts that are supposed to be connecting those uh, radial, big radial liquid fuel boosters are to uh, the actual craft are stopping at the fairing. So I actually don't have any thrusts any struts up there at the top so you can start to see a little bit of uh looks like they're massaging doesn't it it's getting a nice massage that middle craft but of course i don't think this middle craft likes massages oh dear <laughs> Again, simulation mode. I will say what the idea here is actually, uh, it's a moon base. I got a moon base contract, so uh, that was just meant, the moon base is inside that fairing, which remarkably remained intact through all of that. Uh, so anyway, I dealt with all of the strutting and decided to give this another go. Okay, we are not going up. Should have plenty of thrust, oh, it's tilting over. Oh, what the heck's going on here? Oh, jeez, it's hung up on the launch clamp. <laughs> it's lifting it right out of the pad. Oh, this isn't going to go well. Oh, my God. This is like the core of the sun here. Okay, how is the launch pad? <laughs> Is the launch pad still up? Oh! <laughs> oh, got the flag. Oh, that was great. Oh, look at the boosters all like lined up against the launch pad, just burning away. Oh, this is awesome. Oh, oh, oh! One's getting away. One's getting away. Get him! Get him! Where does he think he's going? <laughs> Okay, uh, time for attempt number three. So all I've done here is reposition the launch clamps and we'll see how this goes. Oh, this is looking a lot better. I do love the sound of these boosters. The engine sounds just great. Oh, and now it's doing its roll and everything is nice and stiff. No massaging going on this time. That was all solved with just the addition of more struts. Everything can be solved with just more struts. And in fact, this thing um, inserted itself into low carbon orbit without any issues whatsoever. And then the ultimate irony, I decided to scrap it anyway. <laughs> This is a vehicle you will never see. I'm sorry about that, but uh, I, I just love that. Those, for, by my uh, standards, uh, those were pretty good explosions, so I thought I would show them to you. Yeah, the reason why I ended up scrapping this idea is, uh, you know, what I got to do is I got to put a base on the moon. I still have that contract, and I also have a contract to put a flag on the moon. So, you know, my idea was to put a base down and then fly some Kerbals over there and all that kind of stuff, you know, pretty mundane. And then I thought, you know what, all you need for a base is a craft that can carry five uh, Kerbals. So what I thought I would design instead was a landing craft that brings the whole landing party to a new idea, <laughs> to the landing and the base all at the same time. But of course, that's going to have to be for some future episode. In the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time. Thank you.